the Buddha's teachings start with everybody's sore point, suffering. Whether it's blatant suffering or more subtle forms of stress, these are the sore points in our heart. And for many of us, we don't like to have them touched. We don't like to hear about them. We think that somehow if we ignore them or cover them up, they'll go away. And it just doesn't work. They tend to fester. And we find ourselves carrying this burden around with it all the time. And we think it's a normal, necessary part of life. And when the Buddha talks about suffering, we think he's being pessimistic. Actually, we're the ones who are pessimistic, thinking that we've got to suffer. He says it's suffering in the heart is unnecessary. And there's a way out. And so that's what we're working on here, is the way out of suffering. And it means getting acquainted with the suffering in the heart. That's what a lot of us are scared of, because we don't know how to handle it. When he does, he gives us the tools. Practicing generosity, practicing virtue as ways of creating a sense of well-being, a sense of strength, a sense of esteem in ourselves that come from, on the one hand, being generous, on the other hand, being principled. This strengthens the mind in the face of suffering. And then there's the practice of meditation. This, on the one hand, strengthens the mind as well, but it also makes the mind a lot more sensitive. So we can see exactly where the suffering is. And ferret out all of its all of its tentacles, all the little roots that it has in the heart. So we can pull them all out. And one of the tools he gives us is breath meditation, what we're doing right now, focusing on the breath as it comes in, as it goes out. And sometimes you wonder, well, what does this have to do with understanding suffering? It has lots to do. The one, it gets us more in touch with the present moment, which is where the suffering is. And two, it develops our sensitivity. As you work with the breath, it's like a little kid being given a guitar. At first, the kid just kind of plunks around with the strings, and it's kind of a curiosity, nothing especially deep or moving. But as you get more and more familiar with the strings, more and more sensitive to different ways of playing it, you find that you can end up playing some very moving music on the guitar as you become more and more sensitive to listening to what you're doing. And it's the same with the breath. As you get more and more sensitive to the breath, you find that you develop the sensitivity you need in order to dig deeper into the heart. At the same time, it gives you a sense of exactly how much suffering you're unnecessarily causing yourself, even just by the way you breathe. It's something we do every day. Breathe in, breathe out. And again, it's just one of those things as part of life. But if you turn your attention to the breath and really focus on it, you begin to realize there are comfortable breaths and uncomfortable breaths. And why on earth would you want to breathe an uncomfortable breath? Nobody's forcing you. It's just something we take for granted. But when someone points out, hey, you can breathe in a lot more comfortable ways, you can start exploring that. And as you explore it, you become more sensitive to whole areas of your being in the present moment that you tended to cover up before or tended to ignore. So the simple technique we have of just being with the breath, allowing the breath to be comfortable as, it, you, as you breathe in, as you breathe out, learning how to take advantage of that sense of comfort, allowing it to spread throughout the body. It's an extremely important skill, both for bringing the mind to a stronger state of concentration in the present moment, a sense of a good, solid foundation, and sensitizing yourself to what's going on. Because you're going to need that sensitivity, because the movements of the mind are much more subtle than the movements of the breath. So first you have to develop your sensitivity with the breath, and then you move it into more subtle areas inside the mind itself. So try to have an appreciation for what you're doing. And try to enjoy it as well. 
And John Fuhr would often use the word play with the breath. And that's precisely what you want to do. Play around with it the same way a little kid plays around with a guitar. Experiment to see what different ways of breathing are, what they do to the body, and different ways of conceiving the breath. When you think about the breath, what do you think is happening? There's air coming in and out the nose. But why does it come in and out the nose? What's happening in the body to pull the air in to, and then allow it to go out? What kind of energy flow is doing this? That is also counted as breath. And that's the level of breath you really want to get in touch with. Where does that come in? Where does it come from? Where does it go? You'll find that you have all kinds of different ideas about this. Or maybe you just have one idea about it, but you've allowed it to take over. Learn to open your mind to other ways of conceiving the breath. John Lee talks about the breath coming in and out the back of the skull, in and out the middle of the chest. Lots of different spots in the body. Allow yourself to conceive of the breath in that way and see what happens to your experience of breathing as you do that. And then you find that it expands your rep repertoire, of, okay, your sense of the energy in the body and what you can do with the energy. Because when you find that there are aches and pains in the body, that conceiving of the breath in a particular way will help. Sometimes you can think of the, the breath coming in and out the body right there at the ache and the pain. So you don't have to pull it in or push out. It's right there, readily available, anywhere you want it. Towards the end of my stay in Thailand, I had malaria. And one of the symptoms was that it got harder and harder and harder to breathe, because the muscles that I was using to breathe were just getting worn out and fatigued. And then I remembered that John Lee's comments on the different spots in the head where the breath can come in. So I just told myself, oh, just think of those spots opening up so the breath can come in without you having to pull it in and push it out. It made it a lot easier to breathe. And the pain and the fatigue of the illness was a lot easier to take. So this is a useful skill to have up your sleeve. The same principle applies for dealing with the mind. Different ways of breathing will have different effects on the mind. So when you find yourself discouraged or depressed, okay, change the way you breathe so that you feel more energized. Or you're tense and irritable, okay, change the way you breathe so you're more soothed. There's lots to play with here. This comes under the first base of success. The Buddha said there are four bases of success, or bases for accomplishment and concentrating the mind. And they all come down to the proper attitude you have to have when you're developing a skill. The first thing you need to do is to enjoy what you're doing. And find different ways of getting yourself interested in the breath, exploring the possibilities. If you're sitting here in a bad mood while you're meditating, okay, can you change the way you breathe to change the bad mood? It's possible. Explore. It's much better than going out and buying medicine or doing lots of the other things that people tend to do to erase a bad mood. It doesn't cost anything. It's right here. You don't have to go down to Valley Center to pick it up. So learn how to experiment with what you've got right here. And you get a greater and greater sense of enjoyment in the meditation, that your mind states that you used to find just overwhelming, they're not so overwhelming anymore. You've got a handle on them. Physical states that you used to find irritating, well, they're not so bad. You can find ways of breathing to work around them. So once you find that you're beginning to enjoy this, okay, then the next base for success comes in. That's persistence. You just stick with it. Start applying your skill to all different kinds of things, different kinds of situations. The more you stick with it, the more you begin to appreciate it.
and the greater sense of confidence you have that you can deal with any situation. And John Lee gives the example, you, you've got a friend with you all the time. So whenever any issue comes up, you've got a friend you can depend on. But it's important that you stick with your friend, that you're true to your friend. The more time you spend with it, the more you learn. A couple of years back, The New Yorker had an article on people who develop physical skills. They had a surgeon, and they had Wayne Gretzky, Yo-Yo Ma, Michael Jordan. They talked about the qualities these people all had in common. One was that they really enjoyed what they were doing. They, they found it fun. They had the story of that surgeon who was having trouble operating on brain aneurysms. And so what he did was in, he had some mice in the laboratory, so he induced brain aneurysms in all the little mice. And then in the evening after his work was done, he'd go and he'd operate on the mice. And he found himself enjoying it to the point where he got really good at dealing with aneurysms. So it was a combination, one, of enjoying it, and two, just keeping at it day after day after day. And they talk about the difference between your really good basketball players or hockey players or golfers and excellent ones, and a lot of it's just that element of the time that's put in. You can assume, assume that everybody has a talent when they get to that level. Then there's the big difference is just how much time you put into it, how much interest you show. That's the next base for, basis for success. It's the interest, the sensitivity you bring to it. Exploring different ways that you can use this skill. The ones that aren't taught in the books, the ones that aren't taught by your teachers, but you discover on your own. That sense of discovery that comes from your own interest, that helps to even further your sense of enjoyment in the, in the skill makes it easier to stick with it. And part of that interest is getting a sense, okay, when things don't go well, what do you do? I had a friend who studied pottery in Japan, and over there they have these living national treasures. Her teacher was a living national treasure. And she would put her pots in the, in the kiln, and that some of them would come out okay, and some of them would be totally ruined. Yet day after day, he put this, his pots in the kiln, and they'd come out fine, fine, fine. And she began to wonder, okay, what's, how did he get there? Is it just total lack of talent on her part, or what was the problem? One day she came in early, and it turned out that particular batch of pots he'd put in had all been ruined in the kiln. And so what did he do? He sat in the kiln and tried to figure out what was going on. In other words, he took advantage of his mistakes. It was an opportunity to learn. If you take this attitude, this level of interest, okay, and you really will develop as a meditator, and you really will learn to master the tools that you need for dealing with the problems in your own heart. In that same article, they talked about people applying to I guess it was UC San Francisco, wanting to be brain surgeons. And of course, anybody who's going to apply to a school like that, you assume, is very talented already. But the question is, well, how do you pick among the talented people? And they found one very useful question was, can you tell me about a mistake you made recently? And if the candidate said, well, I can't think of any mistakes I made recently, the candidate was out. If the one says, oh yeah, I made a mistake yesterday, well, come the next question, what did you do about it? And they talked about how they tried to work around the mistake. Those are the ones they admitted to the school and turned out to be the best surgeons. So your willingness to notice when you've made a mistake, learn from it. That level of interest is really important. It makes all the difference in the world. So don't get discouraged when things go wrong. Look at it as a challenge, as an opportunity to learn. It's the difference between people who come in with a lot of self-confidence but no real powers of observation. That doesn't last long. Nothing develops. And the people who really are willing to see, okay, this isn't quite right. Something's got to be done here. What can I do? That's where the fourth quality comes in, your ingenuity.
figuring out ways to get around problems. Sometimes I go to a John Fuhrman with a problem in my meditation and say, yeah, that is a problem, isn't it? <laughs> Send me back up the hill. And sometimes he would answer my question, but other times he just send me back up the hill. Yeah, that is a problem. Look into it. And it's important that you learn how to look into your own problems. This is where all these qualities come together, the, the willingness, the kind of the energy you can put into it, the confidence that, yeah, there's something can be done here. And if I stick with it long enough and I pay careful enough attention, I'll be able to figure it out. What's remarkable about the Buddhist skill is he applies this attitude to, as I said, the sore spots in our heart, the things that we tend to bear with us, as if there's some sort of cross that we have to carry around all during our lives. Well, we don't have to, he said. There's something that can be done about it. And you've got the potential, you've got the, the potential to develop the powers of observation, the ingenuity, the interest that really can make a difference, that can begin to open these problems up. and to deal with them in a way that finally puts an end to them. That's why it's so ironic that Buddhism is called pessimistic, because it's probably the most optimistic teaching there could be. Human beings have the ability to totally transcend suffering. That's what the Buddha says. Not only says it, he also gives us a path to follow. He gives us the techniques, but he also tells us, you've got to develop these qualities of mind and enjoyment in the path, persistence in the path, showing interest and sensitivity in what you're doing, and using your own ingenuity. When I first went over to Thailand, I, you know, the word banya they have in Pali, they also have it in Thai. And the books say, this is wisdom. And I'd come up against a problem in my meditation, and John Fung would say, well, use your wisdom. And I'd say, what wisdom? I don't have any wisdom. And I began to realize that the translation was wrong. It was discernment. Everybody's got some discernment. The Buddha doesn't ask you to use anything you don't have. It's all right here. It's just learning how to make the, the best use of what you've got. In the beginning, it's you're sort of fiddling around with the breath. Again, like a little kid fiddling around with a guitar. But if you pay careful enough attention, and start exploring the possibilities of what this skill can do for you. As the Buddha said, it can take you all the way beyond suffering, all the way to the deathless. Because it was right here that the Buddha found awakening, right at his breath. What's the difference between his breath and our breath? Well, the breath is the same thing, but it was the qualities of mind that he had developed that made all the difference. And again, it's things he developed. It wasn't that he was born with these qualities that we don't have. We've got the same potentials he had. It's simply a difference in learning how to develop those potentials, taking the time, showing the interest, realizing this is really a very worthwhile path. And first, when you hear it, it's just words, games you can play with the mind. When you start getting more and more sensitive to it and begin, as you get more sensitive to the breath, you find yourself opening up inside in ways that you didn't expect. It's just like plunking on those guitar strings and then someday, hey, it sounds really nice, really special. And from that point, the meditation really takes off. 